Hello and welcome to Aspire Church Manchester. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. If you stick around at the end, we'll give you more information about our ministry. But for now, enjoy the preaching. But I want to start off by saying, you know, some people uh, that are Christians come to church, struggle week after week. Every week they're struggling with something new. And I, and I know that we all have fresh problems, but there are some people that are just constantly in struggle all the time. And uh, I recognize that that's the case. Uh, for others, uh, and this is probably the majority of us, problems have a way of creeping into our lives. You weren't expecting it. And then all of a sudden it just seems to creep in. And before you know it, here's another problem. Some of us experience temptations, strong ones, strong ones. Anybody have strong temptations sometimes to do wrong? Sure, sure you do. Yeah, and uh, sometimes they're uh, new versions of old temptations. They just put a new look on them. They just put a new hairdo and paint the, paint the mask, you know, and make it look a little different, but it's really the same thing behind. So we face these things, and I recognize that People feel that way, but longevity has taught me that you need more than just coming to church and a a little bit of prayer. Uh, I've learned that it's when we focus on living out the Christian life that things begin to change. Sometimes it's the things that are actually the problem begin to change. Sometimes it's us that we begin to evolve and change to begin to adapt to the problems and be able to get through, but whatever the case may be, one of the reasons why I preach the way I do and pastor the church the way I do, because there's all different kinds of leaders in God's kingdom. There's some that are very academic, theological, spend a lot of time in that, which I love theology, but I don't preach a lot of that. Uh, Then there's others that are just very motivational and just encourage you every service, and I totally understand that. But I have a firm belief, and this is why I am the way I am, That application of God's word is what brings transformation of our hearts. It's when we can read the Bible, apply it to our lives, and that when we leave on Sunday, we got something we can take with us, something we can do. Now, whether or not we do something is up to you, but nevertheless, that's the goal of what we try to do here. So you get a little bit of all of those things I just described Sometimes there's theology involved with it, you know. Sometimes there's just, come on, you can do it. It's going to be okay. And then other times, you know, there's things that I need to show you and help you with. And so that's the case today. We spent a couple of Sundays uh, talking about moods. You remember that a couple weeks back, a week back, um, talked about those those mental outlooks, those attitudes, those dispositions that we have and how the Old Testament people were serving as examples for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us we're supposed to look at their way they were and look at our lives as warning them as warnings to us and so that we don't fall into some of their same traps. And so we learned that one of the attitudes that they had that was bad was grumbling. You remember that? And then we talked about being able to exchange grumbling with thanksgiving, right? That's the opposite of grumbling, you know. So I feel like I should continue on with that this week uh, on this subject of mental outlooks, dispositions that are gleaned from numbers, uh, other places in the Bible. We're sticking with numbers for a while because these are attitudes that God's people often possess, And sometimes God's word speaks against, and that's why we have to talk about them and bring them out and see how we can get through them. And maybe if they apply to us, we can deal with them in our own hearts. And these attitudes kept the children of Israel in the Old Testament going around in the desert for far too long, man. They had to travel. I want you to think about this. They had to travel 300 miles, albeit on foot and with animals, but 300 miles to get to the promised land. They ended up spending 40 years doing that. So if you think about, we set off today and we had to go a little bit past London. 
on foot, I mean, for us that don't walk like they walk, that might seem like loads of walking, but we could do it, right? We could get there in a, in a month, you know, maybe less. And it took them 40 years. Why? Why? Because of attitudes, mindsets, mental outlooks on things that evolved and translated into actions that they did. And that's why I want to speak to you today so you do not stay in the spiritual desert, that you do not stay in a place. And some of you, maybe, I'll just say maybe, I feel differently, but I'm going to use that very neutral word, maybe, in the place where you've been in a wilderness for a long time. Far too long. And you don't have to be there. You don't have to be there. And so this particular subject is not the most enjoyable to speak about. But nevertheless, it's indeed prevalent and important to all of us. And so the first, the title rather, is The Posture of the Rebellious. Now when we talk about Posture, I'm not talking about that. Say, turn to your neighbor and say, he's not talking about that. He's not talking about that. He's talking about attitude, posture on the inside. Because, see, you can look a certain way, but it's on the inside that matters most. And so before we get into our text here, most of you know this scripture, that 1 Samuel 5.23 says that rebellion is as the sin, is as sinful as witchcraft and Being stubborn, stubbornness is as bad as worshiping idols. Hmm. We don't think like that too much, do we? A lot of us are familiar with witchcraft. A lot of Christians in certain flavors, they talk a lot about witchcraft and a spell, a hex, a curse put upon them, and all of that is valid and true and real. But here you've got rebellion that's being set up almost equivalent to that. So I think we should address it. Yeah? So here in our text, Numbers chapter 16, um, starting at verse number 1. I don't have enough space to put it up, so you're going to have to follow along. This is the English Standard Version. Any of the versions will do, but if you want to follow word for word, it's the ESV. Number 16, the first 11 verses. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son, On, his brother was off. <laughs> Joke, just throwing a little pulpit humor there. And On, or On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with a number of people of Israel, 250 Chiefs of the congregation. How many chiefs of the congregation? How many? Okay, was it 350? No, it was 250, right? Okay, so 250 uh, chiefs of the congregation chosen from the assembly, well-known men. What kind of men were they? Yeah, so they weren't just some bloke that came in off the road. It, what were they? They were, they were known. They had names attached to them. Names like, like Tom and Alan, David. Okay? Goes on and says, They assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, You have gone too far, for all in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? Verse 4, when Moses heard it, he fell on his face and he said to Korah and all his company, in the morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will bring him near to him. That sounds so cool until you read the entire chapter. The one whom he chooses, he will bring near to him. Do this. Take censers. Censers are like big poles and they have places where you could put hot coals or fire on the end of them. It says, do this. Take censers, Korah and all his company. Put fire in them and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the Holy One. You have gone too far, sons of Levi. 
So here we have what we call in L.A. a Mexican standoff. Okay. You've gone too far. No, you've gone too far. Sometimes that's how it is. You've got this tension here. Then it goes on in verse 8 and says, And Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is it too small a thing for you that God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do service in the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister them and that he has brought you near him and all your brothers, the sons of Levi, with you? And would you seek the priesthood also? Therefore, it is against the Lord that you and all your company have gathered together. What is Aaron that you grumble against him? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, today for your word. We do admit that we fall into this category here of rebellious posture from time to time. For some of us, it has gripped our hearts and has a hold of us now. And there are things that are below the surface that no one sees, but you do see, Lord God. And I believe that your word today will expose and to show so that we can repent and be healed and move right and not suffer consequences that belong to those who have rebellious postures. Thank you, Lord God, for your goodness today and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Korah, along with many others, were not happy uh, with Moses and Aaron. They were upset, didn't like it. Some things were not to their liking. And so they gathered this 250 chieftains of the community along with many others, still a small group. It wasn't a large group when you consider that the Israelites were millions of people probably at that time. But nevertheless, it wasn't an unsubstantial group. It, it was a, a significant group of people, especially when you note, and it's super important to note here, that we're not talking about the dregs of society. When we think of rebels, sometimes, at least I do, I think of like rebels, American rebels, you know, with uh, you know, torn denim jackets and leather belts and chains hanging off and big old beards and bad attitudes and willing to do wrong things. I think of rebels like that, you know. But that's not what we have here. What we have here is 250 chiefs of the congregation chosen from the assembly just because of that, because they were so significant. And well-known men, one Bible teacher said these were responsible leaders gone wrong. I think that's probably pretty accurate here. So the point that we're trying to get across before we launch into the gist of the message is a rebellious posture can be found in people who don't appear rebellious. People who look anything but. And that is probably what we see here. Not probably, it is. And it's possible that they could look exactly like you. Could look exactly like me. Because rebellion isn't something you wear as a label on your coat or something on your cap. It's something that's in the heart of people. And when we talk about rebellion, I'm not going to go over this at length here, but I'm, our story is about rebellion against Moses and Aaron and that sort of gist. But I want to tell you, we can be rebellious against a lot of things. We can be rebellious against people, against institutions, against ideas and concepts. We can have a rebellious posture. And that, brothers and sisters, can keep us in the wilderness for far too long. So what it comes down to is that Korah and his band of merry men, what they wanted was what Moses and Aaron had. Moses and Aaron had. And that's the root of rebellion. You want something that you don't have. I want that, but I have this. Doesn't even focus on this. It just, I want that. What might that be? It might be a position might be a little favor, might be a little something, it might be a different spouse, might be a different job, might be how people treat that person, you want them to treat you like that, whatever the case may be, 
we can be like Cor and his band here where we want something that we don't have. And so we have these things that are called the roots, at least I call them, the roots of a rebellious attitude, rebellious mindset. Roots, roots get down. You can't see roots. You only see the fruit up at the top, and sometimes it looks okay, but the roots are what is really part of the the plan. And we could even take it a little bit further when we talk about these five elements here. They may be beyond roots. They may just be seeds. So the things that we're going to discuss here may not be in your heart fully and entrenched, but if they're popping up from time to time and you can find some affinity with what we're going to discuss in just a second, you might have seeds of this in your heart. Now you may think, man, is he just trying to like get at me? Is he, is he like digging hard? Seems to like this a bit much. Not at all. Actually, I hate this. I shouldn't say I hate it. I like delivering God's word. I hate that we have to even talk about this, but because we're all in the same boat, we can all be like Korah and his rebellious bunch. We have to address it honestly and openly and introspectively inside of our own lives. So these roots, seeds of rebellion, we find the first one in Numbers 16 and verse number 3, and it's envy. It's envy. It says they assembled themselves together against Moses And against Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far for all in the congregation are holy, every one of them. And the Lord is among them. Why then do you you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? I just want to point out here that in that verse, they're they're, they're bringing up half-truths, man. It is quite true that the entire congregation was holy. Not just the leaders, not just Moses and Aaron. But then again, neither was the 250 chieftains of the community all that either. In a sense, we're all even before the Lord. We're all holy. We're all separated. We all belong to him. Now, I will say they exaggerated a little bit because look at the statement that they made. They said, for all in the congregation are holy, every one of them. (laughs) I've been around people long enough to know that not every one of them is right. But they were making that extreme statement to get their point across because they wanted to be where Moses was. Envy can drive you to rebel. Envy can drive you to want something that's not yours. Whether it be something spiritual in church, leadership, that sort of thing. Out in the world, a position in your firm, your job, your society, something in your family. Your brother just gets on your last nerve because every time we get together and have a family meal, he talks about his education, he talks about his position, he got another degree and he got another pay rise. And that envy there, and you just want to rebel. Say, who do you think you are? You've gone too far. See, that's what rebellion does. You start making envious comments so half-truths come out. But they also entered a lie, and that's in verse 3. It says to Moses and Aaron, why do you exalt yourself above the congregation of the Lord? Where do they get that from? Where do you see that Moses... And Aaron said, we're the ones, we're the leaders. Listen to me. You, listen to me. Not once. Matter of fact, he's described Moses as as the most humblest man that ever lived. (laughs) So always when you see rebellion in your own life or in someone else, they might say some truths that draw people to themselves. Yeah, you know that. She's just like that. You know that. Oh, I saw that same thing. I know how she can be. And before you know it, you're rebelling, you know, because they have some truth, but there's also a lie. Envy is the root. And remember this as we move along, is that rebellion is almost always about control. About control. I remember many years ago, uh, someone saying they want to ask questions publicly Ask, all, ask away. You can ask question, all the questions that you want. 
issued the answers, gave the answers, told people, they don't even answer the question. No, we answered the question several times over, just not to their liking, just not the answer that they wanted to hear. You have to be very careful that when you're asking a question, you're not really making a declaration, that you really want to know. When you ask of your brother or sister, why, why are you like this or what's going on? Do you really want to know or do you really want to just make a point? Rebellion often is about control. You'll see this in your jobs. You know, you'll have one or two or five that think they have a better idea, you know, a better way of doing things. And they see all the problems. And so what they do is they come and lay out all the problems. And yeah, okay, that's true. But then when you say, so what's the solution? Well... Put me in charge and, and we'll, I'll show you. <laughs> no, that's not a really good answer, is it? It's envy. It's envy. It's control. Number two, seed root of rebellion is when a person becomes beguiled. Beguiled. They were convinced that Moses was a proud and self-important man. They were convinced of this. He must be because everyone's following him and everyone's behind him and he must be uh, uh, so proud and who does he think he is? But then we see this very tale, tell, tale verse in verse number four. It says, when Moses heard this, heard this statement against him, this half truth combined with a lie, what did Moses do? Did he refute it? Hey, hey, Come here, let me tell you. I'll tell you the truth. Who are they? They're nothing. I'm the leader. Listen to me. No, not at all. The Bible says in verse 4, when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. (laughs) He begins to pray. Is this man who is on his face, this one who's over here praying for his detractors to get right with God, is that the one who is uh, uh, so proud and so self-important? Absolutely not. Beguiled. They become convinced, and we have to check our own hearts. We can become so convinced about people. You know, I served with some leaders It was quite some time ago now, a long, long, long time ago, actually. And in that group, they had been convinced that they could see things that other people couldn't see because they were a leader. They could see people, see things in the congregation that other people couldn't see because God showed them because they're a leader. And obviously, there's an element of truth to that, that there's, you know, some things that God does help leaders with. Without God's help, we can't lead. Isn't that true? But they had become so convinced that they knew things that other people didn't know. And they were beguiled. And vice versa. There can be people who are, think that they're so in the know and know these things that, man, that they need to be listened to. Talked to a man who wanted to start a new ministry in our church. This was a while back. Wanted to be in this ministry. I I didn't personally think he was ready for it. I was excited for the ministry, but I didn't think he was quite qualified yet at the moment. I told him so. I said, hey, good brother, but here's what happened, what I see as as a need in your life. And he wasn't having it. He didn't like it. And he didn't even take, I was going to say 10 minutes, he didn't even take 10 seconds to even consider that maybe Something I was saying might be true. And then he begins to go on and tell me how bad all the other people were in the church. You know, and I'm telling you this from a church perspective, but the same spirit's within us, whether it's at work, at home, or with your friends. It's a beguilement. It's a convinced about something being true when it's not true. And yet Moses proved them wrong. He gets on his face and begins to show them that, no, that this isn't the case. (laughs) You would think that that would have liked it. Oh, wait a minute, guys. We got this all wrong. Look at Moses. He's not really this self-important guy. He's a guy that, he's actually a good guy. He's praying for us. He cares. 
He's humble. No, that didn't stop him because they had been already, they were in too deep. And this is why, brothers and sisters, we need to really get a hold of our hearts if we're feeling rebellious. If we have these seeds of rebellion, I'm not going to let him tell me anything. Yeah, she might be my wife, but I'm not going to listen to her. Who does she know? I know who the real her. I'm not talking. I'm not going to listen. Here we see Moses, verse 5, after praying, humbling himself, he has a plan to let the Lord decide. I really like that. He doesn't come and say, okay, let's see who's who. I'll line up on this side. You line up on that side. Let's see who follows me, and that will be the right one. And uh, the other one is a rebel. You know, Didn't do that. He said, no, let's let the Lord decide. He said to Korah and his company, verse 5, in the morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will bring him near to him. Can I tell you, the Lord always shows. The Lord always exposes. The Lord will always show us right and wrong when we're trying to look for it. But I want to also issue this warning to you. He will also show you and expose your heart to you as well if you'll listen. And that's not a pretty thing. Whenever I've had negative things about my personality brought up before the Lord, man, it's rough. It's rough because you almost always know them about yourself already. And now here they are being brought out. The Lord will choose in the morning those that he's going to bring near to him. He says, do this, take censors, Korah, and all his company. The next cause of rebellious posture is one that we studied last week, and that's this attitude of being ungrateful, being ungrateful. So Korah and his band have come to Moses and said, you know, here's what we want. Here's what we think is wrong. Here's where we think things are. We should be in more than what we are. We're already chiefs and well-known men, but we want more. And that's kind of the root of rebellion. You always want more. And the Bible says in verse 8, number 16, verse 8, and Moses said to Korah, hear now, you sons of Levi, Is it too small a thing for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do service in the tabernacle of the Lord, to stand before the congregation to minister, bring you near all your brothers, the sons of Levi with you? And would you seek the priesthood also? God, they had such a powerful position. They had been blessed by God. They were able to serve in places that the majority of the children of Israel couldn't even think about entering. If a common person, a person who wasn't ordained by God, set foot in the places that these people set foot in, they would have to drag them out, dead. And yet, they wanted more. They weren't grateful. This is the root of rebellious. I deserve a pay rise. Do you remember when you first got your job? Remember? You were so happy, weren't you? You're like, man, I love this job. I'm so happy. I can't believe I got, praise God. You come tell, I want to give a testimony, pastor. I want to give a testimony. God gave me a good job. It's good. And you're there six months, right? That changed. Now it's like, ah, this job, man. Those people, I don't know. They got issues here, man, you know. This boss Instead of being grateful, instead of having an attitude that says, yes, I'm so thankful for what I do have. You come to church, people go, oh man, I, you know, I've been pastoring so many years and so many people have come. They left a church because they rebelled at that church. They came to my church and said, this is the church, man. You are the man. You really know how to break down the scriptures, you know. You really know how to bless. You and your wife are so warm, you know. And I'm just thinking every single time, please don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. Because this is going to blow up on you. Give it six months. Give it a year. Oh, man, he's not warm. He's cold, man. He's cold as ice. He can't preach. Who does he think he is? He's trying to build. I had a guy. I'm telling all the stories now, man. Had a guy when I pioneered my first church. We were... About the distance from the church that sent us to the church we were starting, about the distance from Manchester to Oldham. So it wasn't far, but it was, it was a ways. 
started this church. Was, when I say start church, not like modern church plants where I was talking with some church planters here in Manchester, asking them how they started. They, they took 30 people with them to start this church. I'm like, wow. He goes, yeah, we wanted 100, but we got 30. I'm thinking, like, my goodness. You know how we started our church? Tom and Gracie, Tommy, my son, Darlene, my daughter, and Naomi, my other daughter. And Tommy was the usher with a basket on his head, playing around, doing kung fu moves as an usher. You know, this is how we started our church. And by God's grace, we had like five people started coming, and then 10, and we had about 15 people coming after about a year, and we were like pretty happy about it, thinking, man, this is really good. Well, this guy who was uh, from the original church that sent us the distance from Manchester to Oldham decides, I'm going to move out and go to your church. He goes there two times. He wanted to be an usher because he was something in that church. I didn't really know the guy. I said, well, let's hang out. Let's wait. He ended up telling everybody in the church, Pastor Tom just wants to build his own kingdom, his own kingdom. That's why he came out here, so he can be the head kahuna. Look it. If there's anything about me that I am, I'm a lot of things. But one thing I am is a team player, and I don't care about being fully in charge It's not me at all. So him to say that was just so rude. He didn't care that God had given him another chance. It was a feeling of entitlement. And this is what happens when we become uh, full of ingratitude as we start feeling entitled. This is why when you first got your job, hey, whatever you want me to do. Then after a while, you're like, wait a minute. Do you know who I am? Do you know what my job title is? That is not my title. I am sorry. (laughs) You know how in the Bible there's the word stiff-necked? Yeah, that's like snap your neck, too. You know what I'm saying? That's stiff-necked. So when you start getting like, it's the same thing. And that's what happens. It's this attitude of entitled, rebellious posture. People begin to develop this thing. I deserve. I've been here this long. Fair enough. You've been here this long. Whoopee. <laughs> I, I, I don't mean that to be rude. I know it sounds a bit, it, not a bit, sorry, it is sarcastic. But you know, you know who's been here longer? The devil. You know who's been here longer than the devil? Jesus. So you got all of this going on here, and here we are saying, hey, I'm entitled. Ah, come on, let's back up. Don't do that to your boss. It doesn't help. Don't do that in the family. You know, I used to always want to be in my family, like I've told you this before, like the godfather, you know, the patriarch of the family. When I come into the room, you know, they kiss the ring and all of that. And, you know, and trust me, it's far from it. But I learned that that's not my role, and that's not a good role as a dad, as a grandfather, as a, as a patriarchal figure. You know, it's better as a humble role. Hey, how are you doing? What can I do to help you? Hey, thanks for all that you've done. I appreciate that you've been a good child all this time. You know, try to do, take that route. Because if not, I'll be ungrateful for what I do have. And I'm not trying to boast because I've gone through my share of rebellious slots. But rebellion starts, has a root, a seed of ingratitude. And it's often about position. Moses tells him, aren't you happy just to be able to serve? And now you got to be the priesthood too? It's not enough? Wow. Number four, one that I think we all can identify with, and that is stubbornness. Don't raise your hand. Any stubborn... People in church today? Hmm. Number 16, verse 11 says, Therefore, it is against the Lord that you and all your company have gathered together. Not against man. See, sometimes what we do against our boss is really against God. Sometimes what we do against our Brother and sister, our aunties and uncles, is not against family. It's against God, and we have to be very careful of that. Not all the time, but we should be able to take a moment and say, is this God? Am I rebelling against God? Then in verse 12, Moses 
sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. And they said, this is so shocking. We will not come up. Dathan and Abiram typify the mindset of many a rebel. It's just, and if you have a paper Bible, you should underline it, circle it, put it in your notes. Don't ever forget it. But when they said, we will not. Some people are verbal with it, right? They'll just say, we will not. I'm not going to do that. I won't. They, they use words. Sometimes they don't use words and they sit behind a smile. But inside they're going, not a chance. Ain't going to be this day. Not me. Nope. No can do. No way, Jose. Mm-mm, not me. Mm. I ain't moving. Ever have that attitude? Now, well, two of you, I think, are bow- bobbing your heads. The rest are like, stiff neck, not moving, stubborn, not me. We will not. I'm not saying there are not occasions in which we have to stand firm against power structures and say no to those who are in authority. It's not just because someone has a a badge that they wear that that makes them for sure doing the right thing. I've had to tell police officers in my city in Los Angeles, like, I'm sorry, you're wrong. You know, we serve the cops. We help the cops. We invite the cops to our events. But I want to tell you something. The way you're handling this is bad. And there's times when you have to do that. I'm not talking about that because what was going on here, Moses was calling these two rebels and saying, come up, let's talk, let's dialogue. Nope. This is irrational thinking. Stubbornness is irrational, isn't it? (laughs) I was telling someone recently, sometimes I'm stubborn against Gracie. My wife, you know, she'll say something to me. I'm going, in my mind, I'm going, she's right, she's right. I know she's right. But outside, I'm just like, I'm not doing it. I'm not giving in. I'm not moving. I'm staying here, man. This is it. I'm standing my ground. I'm digging my heels in. See, that's the attitude of rebellion. We will not. We will not. We will not. Come on, let's talk. No. If I talk, yeah. Okay, okay, can you tell? No. It's stubbornness. You remember the scripture that we opened up with, 1 Samuel 5, 15, 23. I might have said 5. I'm sorry if I did. It's 15, 23. And it says, stubbornness is like equated with idolatry. It's worse than idolatry. None of us would come and kiss the foot of a statue. None of us would say, let me set up an idol in my home and let's all dance around the idol. You wouldn't do that. But every time you're stubborn against God's chosen plan, against God's desires, against God's word, against God's leaders, you may say, well, my boss isn't God's leaders. Hey, read Romans, man. Romans tells us there's authorities that are in the world that are set up by God that we're subject to. And when you are irrational and stubborn like that, it's always bad. It's self-harming. I don't mean to keep pounding on this, but I just want to finish by saying that some have lived in the wilderness for a long time because they just cannot get over their stubborn ways. They just can't get over. They can't be moved. You can't get them from here to there. They make little steps, but then they backslide hard. You know, they, they say yes for a while, yeah, and they feel the liberty and the freedom. Then they refuse. Brothers and sisters, as a man who loves you, I don't want to see that happen to you. Stubbornness is a seed. of rebellion. Number five, disappointment. Number 16, verse 13 says, Is it a small thing that you have... This is the rebels talking here. Is it a small thing that you have brought us 
up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness. See, they were sad that they had missed the promised land. And they were feeling disappointed that things had not gone according to plan. And in their present circumstances, the way that they viewed it was this is death, this is the end. It wasn't the end, but sometimes we get confused by what we see, and that's where they were at. And they were feeling extremely disappointed. And they says in the same verse that you must also make yourself a prince over us. Moreover, verse 14, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey. You know, see, I find it really, really funny that in the beginning, they're like, everyone's holy. We're all holy. You guys think you're all of that because you set yourself up. But when they didn't get what they wanted, you didn't do your job. Isn't that how we are? This is a sign of rebellion. When things go right, we want to be elevated. It's great. The church has 100 people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me be. Oh, we lost 20 people. Oh, oh wait, wait, wait. I don't know. If I... What are you going to do, pastor, to help fix the church? <laughs> See, you want to blame people. Parents want to do this. Kids want to do this. They back and forth. See, unmet expectation is the fuel for so many bad attitudes, man. There are many times when I look back at my life, I'm sharing something with you. You can call it confession. You can call it whatever you want, but I'm sharing to identify with you. That when I look back at my life, when I've acted out, when I've not been the, the godly man that I know that I'm capable of and is supposed to be, Oftentimes, it's because I didn't feel like I was blessed. My expectation was unmet. I expected this. It didn't happen. And I said, ah. Unmet expectation is at the core of many. And this is why they ask, why is that? Why? Why? It's because they're not feeling fulfilled in their own heart. Spouses often rebel against each other in time because of disappointment. I thought you'd be different. I thought you'd be like this. I know what I'm talking about. 42 years of marriage, you guys celebrated with us. Thank you for that. But I can tell you 42 marriage is also 42 years of disappointment from time to time. Times when I wasn't the man that Gracie thought I was, and vice versa. And the point is, is that when someone disappoints you, you feel no need to listen anymore. You find out that your pastor or your pastor's wife or a leader in the church or a brother who claims to know God in his word and he didn't quite measure up or maybe failed miserably at measuring up, and immediately you say, ah, why? Why? One of my family members, someone in their church that they belong to, it's not part of our name, Shift Ministries Church, a different church, could happen anywhere though. Uh, One of their leaders was found to be, found out to be in gross sin, and they fired him, rightfully so. Rightfully so. So they fired him and felt bad for the kids, you know, because here they are going through some more problems, more unmet expectations, more disappointments. But I said, hang in there, man. God, It's working. It's doing the right thing. I mean, the fact that they fired him shows that God's involved. Shows that God's taking care of this. See, this is why we can't pull back just because we're disappointed over where we're at in life. We can't rebel against God and his word just because my expectations were not met. <laughs> this is one I can identify with, you know. At this stage in life... I thought I'd be this. <laughs> you know, I was walking recently in town and I was walking to my study place that I go. I need distractions sometimes, so I go to study and I spent a number of hours quite tired, man. And so I come out and I'm walking, you know, and there's this crowd walking with me. And I try to walk fast or faster than the crowd to stay up so I don't get older than I already am. And I just... I was walking along and I looked around and I feel like I'm just like everybody else. But I noticed that 
out of all the people that I could see, I go, none are as old as me. I'm the oldest guy in this city center crowd. Disappointing, man. Discouraging. My body on the inside feels a certain way, but the reality is different. Sometimes in life, you expect things to be at a certain place, but the reality is different. It's not what you expected. Disappointment. Be careful because you can develop a rebellious posture. Can you say amen? Amen. We're going to finish. Thank you for being so engaging this morning. I really appreciate it. The last thought, and I know you know this, Brother Shola, as he picked up the offering today, thank you, brother. Good job. Good job. Very well done. Thank you. Don't forget your phone next time. It's good. (laughs) Rebellion has consequences. Consequences, doesn't it? Here in verse 15, I love this verse, and Moses was very angry. It's okay to be angry. Sometimes when your kids rebel against you, it's okay to be angry. It's not okay to act out on the anger, but it's okay to be angry. Moses was very angry, and he said to the Lord, and that's good. It was not that he was very angry and said to Korah. He was very angry, and he said to these 250 chieftains, hey, I'm your pastor. He didn't do that. He said to the Lord, do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them. That's Old Testament speak right there. I have not taken one donkey from them, and I have not harmed one of them. That's always true, though, bro. I want to say, Moses, hey, look at man. I tell you, the man of experience, Moses, uh, it's always true. You never hurt people. They just claim you hurt them. They just say you did this. It's really their bad attitude that it was the problem, but they're blaming you, Moses, and I, I know how you feel, bro. You know, you raise your kids, you think these are going to be wonderful kids, and then all of a sudden, you're the result of all their problems, you know, or the root of all their problems, you know. The way you raised me, the way you did this. Please, don't take it personally, guys. Don't, it'll kill you, man. It'll kill you. It's just not true. It's just not true, man. (laughs) My most rebellious child rebellious, beyond, (laughs) Hopney and Phineas rebellious, read the story, came and said, I never was your fault, but all through the teenage years, you, you, mom, mom, no, it's not you. Verse 16, and Moses said to Korah, be present, you and all your company before the Lord, and they, you and they, and Aaron tomorrow, it's like, it reminds me of one of those uh, American Western film. <laughs> come out at high noon, you know, with the big old black hat. And come out and got the gun on their side. Call you out. That's what it felt like to me when I read it. And let every one of you take his censer and put incense on it. And every one of you bring them before the Lord his censer. 250 censers, you also and Aaron, each his censer. So every man took his censer and put fire in and laid incense on them and stood at the entrance of the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron. The tent of meeting was the place where Moses met with God in a very intimate place. This is where the showdown was taking that place, in God's presence. This was not some backroom deal. This wasn't some church political uh, uh, finagling. This was like, no, no, enough of this, enough of this. We're going to bring this out before God and man. I know in our modern generation, boy, you get, you get fired you, as a pastor if you start saying, man, we're going to bring this out, expose this. But I don't think that it's always wrong. So a man took his censer and put fire in them, laid incense on them, stood at the entrance of the tent of the meeting with Moses and Aaron. Then Korah assembled all the congregation against them. I just think against them, against them. I think about Alexander the coppersmith that did Paul, the apostle, much harm. I think, you know, Paul could have been Paul. You know, Paul might have had attitudes and stuff, but man, you were going to be that bad that you were going to harm them, that you wanted to get even with them. 
Moses and Aaron, I mean, my God, look what the job that they had. Couldn't you see trying to lead a million people? Man, I had three kids and some grandkids it's hard to lead. Here you got a million, and we stand against them. Not just anywhere, but in the tent of meeting, at the door of the tent of meeting. Here they are. I don't know. I don't know. Then Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. I wonder what they thought at that point. Ah, yeah. Rebels always think, yeah, they're going to get theirs. God, here you go. Been waiting for this moment. Moses, Aaron, shaking in your boots? You ought to be. That's the way the rebels feel. They couldn't be more wrong. Oftentimes when we have a rebellious posture, we think one way. We think this is going to happen. Ah, oh, man, I'm going to show her. I'm going to show her what's up. I had a pastor friend who was telling a story about when he, him and his wife got in a fight and he was going to show her and grabbed his blanket and got out of bed and went slept on the couch. The couch is all uncomfortable. He's there. He's there for about half an hour and Finally, he just says, I'm going to get up now. I'll go in there and see if she's ready to apologize. He went in there. She was asleep. (laughs) Did not care. It's what rebellion does, doesn't it? It gets us to think. Oh, yeah. Here we are at the entrance of the tent of meeting. The glory of the Lord has appeared to all the congregation. But verse 20 says, And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, not to Korah, and his band of merry men. What did he say? Verse 21. Separate yourselves from among this congregation. Hmm. That I may consume them in a moment. There are consequences for rebellious attitudes. Now, do I think that you and I and us are so rebellious that God's going to consume us and we all, I'm not saying that, but the Bible says 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that we're to learn from these stories. And what do I learn from these stories? That there are consequences for those who take up rebellion against instituted authority, whether it be in the church, in the home, in the world, concepts, the idea that, ah, we're not going to do church anymore. Church is an antiquated thing. No, that's an institution set up by God. Uh, I'm not going to give offering anymore. That's antiquated. That's just for, uh, uh, as our brother said, for preachers who want preachers who want to get rich. We can't stop. There are preachers who just want to get rich, but we don't stop that because that's God's institution. We don't rebel against these things because there's judgment that comes, consequences that come. Verse 22, look what Moses did and Aaron, and they fell on their faces. I would have thought, let's say the the shoe was on the other foot. Let's say that Korah and his group uh, heard, and and God spoke to them and said, you know, stand back because I'm going to consume Moses and Aaron right now, and I don't want you guys to get caught up in the the riffraff, you know. What, what, What do you think their attitude would have been? About time. Yep. You guys think you're all that? <laughs> Would have been their attitude. What was Moses and Aaron's attitude? They fell on their faces. Said, Oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and will you be angry with all the congregation? See, still not concerned with themselves, man. Still concerned with others. Don't rebel against church, God, your job, whatever. Don't rebel because it's not just about you. It affects others. And this is Moses and Aaron showing that they're truly God's men, saying, God, please, there's a, there's a lot of people here who just don't know what's going on. They don't, don't let them get swept up in this nonsense. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Say to the congregation... Get away from the dwelling of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. I think 
Dathan and Abiram were included in Kor- with Korah because of what they said, we will not go. I think God was demonstrating that there's consequences, not just for re- open rebellion, but also for stubborn hearts. It says, get away from the dwelling of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Then Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram and the elders of Israel followed him, verse 26, and he spoke to the congregation. We're almost done. Hang with me, guys. He spoke to the congregation saying, Depart, please, from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing of theirs, lest you be swept away with all their sins. So challenging. So, um, you know, we use awe in a good way, but I'm saying awe-inspiring in a bad way, and you know, like, whoa, like, oh, my God, look what's happening. See, there's consequences, and obviously the, you can read, and the Bible says that they, verse 31 through 34, that the earth opened up, and they fell in, and they swallowed up these rebels, because God's just not having nothing with those who maintain this rebellious heart. There's some that are beyond the obvious that I don't have time to tell you. About the leaders had to withdraw from these people whenever we're rebellious. It, 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 it's hard for people to lead us. It's hard for people to lead us. You want your wife to submit, but you're not a, a kind of a leader. And there's this thing. Leaders withdraw from those who are rebellious. Does your boss seem distant, disconnected? Maybe that's because your rebelliousness posture is coming out. Now, ones who wanted to work with you no longer does because of the way that you've been acting. Maybe he's not listening to you anymore because you think you know everything. You've already put your cards on the table. You've blown your whistle. Unfortunately, in verse 41, and we'll close with this, is that you'd think that that would be the end of it. You'd think people would learn My hope would be after you hear this that everyone would say, what's the antonym for rebellion? It's submission. Let me be submissive. Let me stop being rebellious. Let me that would be my hope. That'd be my desire. But the truth is, vicious circles often continue. Number 16, verse 41. But on the next day, this is the day after the earth swallowed them up all the congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and against Aaron saying you have killed the people of the Lord you you, you know there's uh, people are fickle we know that right we're fickle people but man when you read that that is like the, 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 the fickle trophy of this eternity You just saw these people swallowed up. You just saw Moses and Aaron standing, praying, believing. You just saw God exonerating these two men. You just saw God condemning the others. And here you are going, oh yeah, Moses and Aaron, you're the problem. I thought, what is that? Why is the people like that? What what would cause this vicious circle to continue? And I want to tell you, the only thing that I could come up with is that these people did not really know the Lord very deeply. They did not really know God. Sometimes our superficial Christianity gets us in trouble and it catches up with us after a while. We see things happening around us and we think, oh yeah, we know, I'm in church, I know. No, it's not are you in church. The thing is, do you know him? Do you know him? So I've taken a lot of your time today. But I'm thankful, but I'm also prayerful that you would search your heart and say, is there rebellion in me? We talked about grumbling, and many said that wasn't them. They, they're not grumblers. Fantastic. Good. But now we're talking about something that no one can see. Only you, but I'll say also the God of the seven spirits sees. The spirit of Jesus sees. Do you see Will you repent or will you just continue on in danger of consequences that are beyond your control 
in danger of being in the position like these were, making false accusations, false claims. They blame Moses for getting it wrong. And then at the end, these ones that were left that had saw it all, it couldn't have been clearer for them. You have killed the people of the Lord. The rebels were the people of God. The ones who loved the rebels were the ones that were murderers in their eyes. You say, well, that won't be me. Certainly it could be you. Certainly it could be me. See, Christianity, and I'm closing, I promise, (laughs) is not just about saying you're Christian. Being in ministry is not just saying I have a title. I'm in ministry. It's not just saying I do love people. It's about action. It's about doing. It's about effort. And it starts in here. And today, if you'd say, Lord, there's a wicked way in me. Might not be as bad as Korah and the 250 and the others that got swallowed up. But we didn't say that, did we? We said they're seeds. If that's you, we want to get right here. Be cleansed. Why don't we all stand to our feet? Let's all stand, please. Let's all stand. Lord, I thank you for your people. I praise you for your people, oh God. I thank you for each and every one that you've brought into this church, those that are part of this church and just attending to be a place that they can worship you for a season, Lord God. Let, let, let blessing fall upon them. For those that are the core of the church, trying to see advancement and see souls saved and ministries raised up that benefit the world, Lord God, I pray, I pray that they would understand this issue, posture, rebellion. Those that are so blind that they cannot see, I do pray, God, that they would open their eyes, but even if they don't open their eyes, let me love them like you love them. Help me to treat them the way that you treat them, God. I pray blessing upon families, parents who are struggling, going through things, Spouses who don't know where to go next, bless them and help them. Father, we thank you for all that you're doing today. In Jesus' name. Today, I just want to open the altar. Normally, we make an altar call for people to come to Christ. And if you need to come to Christ, obviously, we'll pray with you and need to lead you to Jesus. But I don't want to delay. I want to talk to my brothers and sisters and say, hey, is there any kind of rebellion in you? I don't think Korah woke up one day and said, you know what, forget Moses and Aaron. Hate them. I think it started off, Moses said something, did something. Korah and the 250, they didn't get the little blessing. They thought that was coming. Oh, it's coming, it's coming. Yeah, Moses and Aaron, yeah, yeah. Then when that didn't come, ah, I didn't get it. The job didn't come through, man. The wife didn't act like it. the husband wasn't there for me. My, my kids, I showed them love for years. And look how can have these attitudes, little roots of rebellion. I don't want to repeat all that I preach, but if anything has tugged at your heart and you need to get some things, I always say right, but I mean open before God, honest before God. You need to just want to make a, not so much a public declaration, but an open declaration of what's going on in here. If that's you, please come on up to the front. You can kneel down if you want. You can pray. If you want to stand, if you're not a kneeler, that's okay too. But whichever way you come, come with an attitude of humility, please. Humility, humility, humility. Humility. For those that want to kneel, there's a little more room over here if you want to kneel. If you want to stand, that's fine. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we admit that sometimes the authority that's over us, the, the plan that you've put in place, the circumstances that you've ordained, that is your plan for the moment, 
are not appealing to us, Lord. And we admit that we fight against that. Today, help us not to be those people. Help us to be people like Moses and Aaron of humility and honor, caring about the congregation more than we care about our own hearts and lives. Father, I am praying for husbands and wives so hard, so hard sometimes. But we know you have a a plan, a rank, some issues of the heart that need to be in place. We don't want them to be in place. We want to have freedom, God. We admit it. But God, have you constrained us as you have constricted our path Help us to walk in that, to walk in that, Lord God. Thank you, God, for your goodness and your grace. Bless these that have come to the front today. Bless those that are in their seat, those that are watching online. Help them all. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. You're keeping power. You're keeping power. Your favor, Holy Spirit, have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Solidify in our heart. Remind us of the words of Jesus moment by moment. Help us to walk in gratitude and thankfulness, Lord God. Help us to not walk in delusion and beguilement about circumstances and situations. Let us see them how they really are. And more importantly, even how you see them. Lord God, let us be those kind of people. Let us not allow the disappointments in life to guide our paths, Lord God. To change our hearts to divert our focus. Let us be people who acknowledge you in all things, honor you in all ways, Lord God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. If you're at the front, why don't you just stand, stay right where you're at. The rest of you, if you want to get prayed for, we're going to pray and close right now. You want in prayer, come on up to the front. Maybe to make the altar call, but you want prayer for the week. I'm praying over people, but I'm only praying for those that come up. You may say, well, that sounds rude. No, sometimes it is how it is. I'm praying for those that come up. You want that prayer. If you don't need it, fair enough. Yeah, I know we're all powerful. We all can pray. But if you want this prayer, I want you to come up. I want you to come up. I want you to come up. Thank you, Jesus. Sometimes we've got to move from where we're at to where we need to be, even before we're where we need to be. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters that are here in this place today. I pray blessing upon their life, favor and grace upon them, Lord. This is beyond religiosity. Let this never be a religious organization. Never let this just be another clone of another ministry. Let us never be that. Let us always be the people that you want us to be. Let Aspire be who you want uh, Aspire to be. We admit we're not better than anyone else. We know that we're not so unique and that there's none like us. We admit that freely, but nevertheless, Lord God, we do believe that your hand is upon us as individuals and we need to respond accordingly. And Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here today, the ones that are honest about the things they're wrestling with in their life. We admit that. We repent daily, God, of things that are wrong. We die to ourselves daily as Paul the Apostle did. We desire daily, Lord God, your word that is our bread and is our meat. Uh, We live according to your word, Lord. Let that be first and foremost. Let us not just read it, but let us live it. God, I pray blessing upon us as we leave this place. I pray covering hedge and protection upon your people today. I pray for families, uh, uh, children, Bless the children, God, as they go to school, as they face opposition there, especially the teenagers, as they're faced with all kinds of sexual temptation, moral temptation, the anti-God sentiment that is in the 
places of education today. We come against that, God. We stand firm upon you because you are the king. You rule over that. And we thank you, God, for your goodness today. Protect your people. I pray marriages today that as they leave this place that they would have a great day. They'd have a great day. If they have to go to work, Lord God, let them go to work with a kiss on their lips. Let them go to work, God, with blessing in their heart. Let them feel it. Feel it, Lord God. Thank you for your goodness today. Bless the refreshments as we're about to leave, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Give the Lord a big hand clap today. Praise God. Praise God. So a couple of the young brothers were um, giving me a compliment a few weeks ago about and you always finish bang on time, you know. You always get it right. right? Well, today I failed them. I went a little over, but sometimes we need a little bit more. Can you say amen? amen? Praise God. Thank you for listening. Love on one another. God bless you, and have a blessed week. And hope. To- Thank you for joining us today at Aspire Church. If the message today has blessed you, or there's something we can help you with, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email to info at aspirechurch.com dot co dot uk we meet in different locations throughout the week and if you'd like to join us in person we'd love to have you visit us you can find all the details on our website at www.aspirechurch.co.uk or if you'd like further information find us on facebook look us up on twitter we also live stream all of our services and once again if you'd like to view online you can find all the details on our website Thank you for joining us today, being part of our ministry. We'd love to help you in any way that we can. God bless you.